Hi, everyone. Um, so the research I'm going to talk about today arose because I read quite a lot of papers in quantum foundations, which proceed by placing uh, quantum mechanics in a wider space of theories uh, and seeking to prove theorems about the relationships between various theories in that space. And this sort of research is usually advertised as providing like insight or understanding into quantum mechanics in some sense. And I do share the intuition that we gain some sort of understanding from these sorts of results. But I think it's non-trivial to say what exactly we learn when we prove this sort of result. Um, and although there do exist some uh, ex philosophical discussions of this topic, uh, most approaches tend to be uh, quite strongly anti-realist or in instrumentalist in flavor. Um, so, for instance, we've seen suggestions that we should think about quantum mechanics as being about information or about language. Um, and I myself, being somewhat more realist in, in inclination, uh, set out to understand how it would be appropriate to understand this sort of research from the point of view of someone who wants to take a realist view towards quantum mechanics um, and towards science in general. So, uh, I'll, this is what I'll do. I'll start by giving a sh short review of the, the, the sort of framework, and in particular, the, the generalized probabilistic theories framework. I'll then explain some of the obstacles to giving a realist account of this sort of research. I'll make some comments on the ongoing discussion about whether we should axiomatize or interpret quantum mechanics. Um, I'll then present uh, my, my structural interpretation of this form of research. Uh, I'll discuss some uh, interpretational issues that arise along the way, and finally make some uh, comments on the future of this sort of research. So uh, generalized probabilistic theories belong to us at a set of related research programs uh, in quantum foundations, uh, uh, which also includes the approaches like device independent approaches, uh, operational theories, non-local boxes, and so on. And all of these uh, approaches have in common the idea that we put quantum mechanics in some wider operationally defined space and study relationships in that space. But all of these frameworks have quite a lot in common, and much of what I say will apply to all of all of them. However, for the sake of specificity, I'm going to focus on GPTs here. So a generalized probabilistic theory is a quadruple consisting of a set of preparations, a set of measurements, a set of transformations, and a probability a set of probability functions which specify the probabilities for various outcomes conditional on uh, previous preparations, measurements, and transformations. Uh, so because this framework is explicitly operational and doesn't make reference to any theoretical entities or any sort of background theoretical framework. Results in this framework take the approximate form. Uh, every uh, GPT which has the property A also has the property B. Uh, and this is understood as uh, as, as suggesting that uh, property A in some sense explains property B. So for example, there's a nice result by Toner which proved, which demonstrates that uh, every GPT which is non-signaling must uh, must exhibit some sort of monogamy bound, bound on uh, multipartite non-local correlations. Uh, it's also very popular to use this sort of framework to, pr to produce what's known as an axiomatization of quantum mechanics. Uh, so in that, uh, in, in, within the framework, we set out um, a collection of principles or axioms, each of which specifies some sort of th feature, feature that a GPT, GPT might have. And then we show that quantum mechanics is the only uh, GPT which satisfies all of these axioms. Uh, so one, one classic of the genre is Hardy's quantum theory from five reasonable axioms. Um, and there are also uh, many more recent examples, such as existence of an information unit as a postulate of quantum theory, uh, which is due to Marcus Muller and friends. So as I say, uh, most existing interpretations of this framework tend to be uh, quite instrumentalist or anti-realist in character. And that's not a coincidence because there are a number of obvi obvious obstacles to giving a realist interpretation of this research. Uh, so first, first off, um, the framework is explicitly operational in character. It's specifically designed to prevent us from making reference to theoretical entities or systems or any, any sort of uh, theoretical baggage of that kind. Um, and that looks uh, like a prima facie, like a challenge for scientific realism, given that uh, so re realism is often parsed as realism about theoretical entities. Uh, so for instance, Grinbaum has argued that we should think of this move towards device independent frameworks as physics moving away from uh, working in terms of systems and entities and towards some other type of physics. 
uh, but the obvious move for the realist here is, is to uh, move away from realism about entities towards a form of realism which likewise does away with theoretical entities, which is to say structural realism. So the realist can think about this type of research as being an approach towards studying structure independent of reference to specific entities. And that's, that is the, the route that I'll be taking here. Uh, the second difficulty is that this research involves uh, studying a space of theories which are counterfactual. So of this very large space of theories that we're studying, uh, at most one of them uh, can, can possibly apply to the real world. Uh, so one might naturally ask what could possibly be realist about all these results uh, concerning the relationships between theories which are not real. However, uh, it's been recognized by a variety of commentators that uh, one plausible route for, for structural realism to avoid the Newman problem uh, is to go down the route of using intentional structures and intentional relations. And in particular, uh, it's commonly suggested that the relations in question must be modal relations. Uh, so relations like counterfactual dependence, causation, metaphysical necessitation, and so on. Um, and of course, uh, these modal relations are frequently analyzed by philosophers within the framework of possible worlds and the possible world semantics for modal logic. Uh, and the point I want to make here is that uh, the space of possible theories investigated by the GPT framework uh, looks very similar to the space of possible worlds uh, investigated in modal logic. And so I'm going to suggest that uh, we should think of these re results describing counterfactual theories as being a way of analyzing the modal structure of quantum mechanics and of reality. Uh, so rather than rather than thinking of this, this research as dealing with counterfactual possibilities, we should think of it as dealing with uh, real objective structure. Uh, the final obstacle is that uh, if we're going to think of all these different expertizations of quantum mechanics as representing distinct structures, it looks as if we're going to have a pretty severe case of underdetermination of structure by evidence. And underdetermination is, of course, often regarded as a serious challenge for realism. Um, and I'm going to argue that uh, in certain sorts of cases, uh, underdetermination shouldn't be considered a threat to realism and should rather be seen as an opportunity to make progress. And I I'll suggest that this is indeed uh, one such case. So in light of the success of the axiomatization program and in light of the continued difficulty of finding an interpretation of quantum mechanics which meets everyone's approval, uh, some people working in this area have made the suggestion that we should stop trying to interpret quantum mechanics and instead move to axiomatizing it. Uh, so for instance, Ravelli has said that quantum mechanics will cease to be puzzling only when we can derive it from a set of simple physical principles. Um, and there are a couple of uh, comments to be made here. The first is that interpreting quantum mechanics is not uh, merely about reaching an, a sort of subjective feeling of understanding. Uh, interpreting quantum mechanics is also about filling in some real scientific incompletenesses in the theory. So in particular, there's the problem that the theory doesn't give us a precise prescription for when to switch from unitary evolution to non-unitary evolution. Uh, and that means that there can be situations like the Frasch Renner thought experiment, where we can derive uh, contradictory predictions from quantum mechanics by putting that uh, distinction between unitary and un non-unitary evolution in a different place. So uh, it's, not it's not enough for quantum mechanics to cease to seem puzzling. It also, we also have to solve this problem of how to uh, apply the theory in these special sorts of cases. And axiomatizations of quantum mechanics in general don't really offer any route to solve that problem uh, because they take measurement to be an unanalyzed primitive and therefore they say nothing about uh, when we should take a measurement to have occurred. I can see a possible route where one might, for example, uh, take measurement to be defined functionally by the axioms, and one might uh, then hope that if the axioms are specific enough, this might start to answer questions about what happens in the frausch garena case and others like it. Uh, but as far as I know, no one has yet gone down that route, and so at least for the present, uh, it looks like we can't, we can't simply replace interpretation with axiomatization. We're going to need uh, at least, uh, we're going to need to interpret and also axiomatize. Uh, but I want to put the measurement problem aside for now uh, and henceforth meet the uh, axiomatization program on its own terms, so to speak. So I'll henceforth assume that we do have well-defined categories of preparation, measurement and transformation, uh, and that there's never any doubt about how to apply those terms. And I'm going to argue that even under those circumstances, uh, there is still a need for the axiomatization program to be interpreted. So the difficulty is basically as follows. The structure of an axiomatization is we provide a set of principles or axioms, and each of these axioms singles out some subset of the G space of GPTs. Uh, and we then demonstrate that the only GPT which lies in the, in the intersection of all of these subsets is the GPT formulation of quantum mechanics, which I'll refer to as QM. 
Now, the difficulty is that because the space of GPTs is continuous due to the continuous parametrizations of quantum mechanics, um, it's straightforward to see that there, there must be an infinite number of ways of, of choosing subsets which can, whose intersection contains only QM. So, for example, I can trivially select two GPTs at random A and B and say that my first axiom is the set A Q M and my second axiom is the set B Q M. Um, and obviously this axiomatization does succeed in uniquely singling out, out quantum mechanics, but if I were to write a research paper on it, nobody would think that was very interesting or exciting. So the question is, what is it that makes some axiomatizations interesting and are the axiomatizations trivial? Uh, so the proponents of this approach have had various things to say about this. Ravelli, for instance, says that, that the axioms must have physical content and must be experimentally true. Greenbaum says they must be simple, physical, and easy for scientists to understand. And the difficulty here is that it's not clear to me that any of these uh, specifications really rule out axioms like the set AQM. That set, you know, insofar as we know that quantum mechanics is true, we know that that, that, that axiom is experimentally true. It does say something physical. It is pretty simple. And from, from a point, certain point of view, it's easy to understand. Now, obviously, Ravelli and Grimbaum have something else in mind when they talk about simplicity and easiness to understand. But it, I think they need to specify more clearly what sort of simplicity they have in mind. So it seems to me that what's really going on here is that these sorts of comments are drawing implicitly on our intuitions about fundamentality. Uh, so there are certain sorts of statements about reality which we're kind of willing to accept as possibly fundamental and other sorts of statements which we're not willing to accept as fundamental. So for example, an axiom of the form, there exists a fundamental unit of information, looks as if it might be some sort of fundamental reality about, about the world. Um, and we're, we're therefore willing to accept that uh, that sort of axiom might explain why QM is the GPT which holds in the actual world. Whereas an axiom like AQM doesn't look particularly fundamental, and in that kind of case, we're inclined to think, to think the relationship of explanation goes in the other direction. We think the fact that QM holds in the actual world is the reason why the axiom AQM is true of the actual world. So all of this is to say that it seems to me that we, we probably can't determine what counts as a good axiomatization purely by appeal to to the formal structure of the axioms. Uh, that account needs to be relativized to some uh, other account of what the contents of reality are and what the role of these axioms is, what, what purpose we, we, intend, we intend to fulfill by giving this axiomatization. So there are a number of possible ways one might uh, give that sort of account. The first, the first most obvious thing to do is give a purely practical rationale and say, well, we, we like to have simple, simple axiomatizations because they make it easier to do calculations. Um, and that's a perfectly valid rationale, but it doesn't seem to be what's going on here. Uh, first, because uh, no one, as far as I'm aware, seems to be suggesting that we should use operational axiomatizations of quantum mechanics to actually do calculations. Um, and nor does it seem likely that, that those calculations would be easier in most cases. Uh, and furthermore, the practical explanation wouldn't really make sense of all this talk about intuition and understanding. A second possibility is to adopt a Humean approach. So this would involve saying, the true laws of nature uh, are the, the axioms of the best systematization of everything that really happens in the actual universe. Um, so then we can say that when someone proposes a new axiomatization of quantum mechanics, what they're doing is trying to find a better systematization of our existing uh, empirical data on, on the basis that this better systematization is likely to be closer to the true uh, laws of nature as defined by the real best system. Um, and there are some really nice things about this account. In particular, I think this is a really good counterexample to the argument sometimes made against Humeans that uh, this best systematization thing doesn't explain, doesn't uh, provide a good description of what scientists really do, because here we have a scientific community which is precisely engaged in doing what looks a lot like looking for a best system. However, I am not a Humean for various reasons. Uh, the reason I think is that's most relevant here is that um, in a human universe without necessary connections. Uh, there's no particular reason to think that, that the data we've observed so far is likely to be a representative sample of, uh, of the universe as a whole. And given that, uh, obviously, we've only observed a very small subset of the universe, there's no particular reason to think that the systematization that we can, that we can make of our existing data will be very close to the systematization uh, that would result from the best system on the whole of the universe. So it looks as though there's no particular reason for the human to think that that systematization of quantum mechanics will tell them any, anything 
will tell tell us very much about the true laws of nature as that feature in the, the overall best human human and best system. And there's also no particular reason to think that. Uh, the best systematization of our existing data will be predictive. So I personally find it difficult to see what the purpose of, of this whole process would be in, within the human picture. Um, that said, I know I'm not going to convince any humans in the audience in the next three minutes, so I will simply observe that I did set out to find a robustly realist account of this sort of research and the human account uh, doesn't really seem to have uh, as strong, strong a resonance flavor, as, as, as strongly realist a flavor as I would like. So finally, the realist option I here is, I suggest, to suppose that there's some uh, true objective structure which gives rise to quantum mechanics, and that when we propose axiomatizations of quantum mechanics, these should be regarded as hypotheses about the nature of this true underlying objective structure. Uh, so uh, in that in that picture, we can understand our preference over different types of axioms in the usual sort of way uh, as corresponding to basically just hypothesis selection. Uh, so our preference for simple axioms is is directly analogous to our preference, preference for simple hypotheses. Um, and and the, same, the same can be said for whatever other criteria we might apply to our, our axiom selection. So um, uh, in this picture, the, the process of axiomatizing quantum mechanics ca it can be understood as a form of structural realism. There's some uh, underlying structure which we're trying to find out about by, proposing, uh, by imposing various sorts of theoretical structures on quantum mechanics. So I want therefore to now, now stop and think a little bit more about the types of structure that are involved here. So a little bit of terminology. Uh, I'm going to use the term Humean mosaic in the standard way to refer to the set of all local matters of particular facts uh, within a given possible world. Um, so given that GPTs are, are expressed fully in operational terms, it's clear that given a Humean mosaic, we may sometimes be able to specify a GPT which predicts the events on this Humean mosaic. Now that's not guaranteed. Uh, the, the Humean mosaic will have to have at least some minimum level of order in order to make that possible. So for example, it's necessary that there should be uh, repeated instances of the same preparation, measurement and transformation at, at various points over the mosaic. Um, and if we'd like the GPT associated to the mosaic to be unique, then it will also have to be the case that uh, there exist fairly robust probabilistic relationships between the preparations, measurements and transformations on the mosaic. So I'm going to define a special set of human mosaics, which I'll refer to as the GPT mosaics, which are simply the mosaics for which there exists a unique GPT predicting the relationships uh, on, the, on that mosaic with a com combination of simplicity, strength, and fit, which is robustly better than any alternative. So I'm using robustly uh, in the same sense as Lewis here uh, to mean that the, the fit should be better than the alternatives by any reasonable standard of simplicity. Um, so now, clearly by definition, uh, we can clearly by definition, given uh, any GPT mosaic, we can map it to a uh, corresponding GPT. Conversely, given any GPT, we can come up with at least one GPT mosaic, uh, which for which this would be the associated GPT. For example, we can do that by simply uh, creating a world which contains a very large number of, of instances of, of each possible type of experiment defined by the GPT, uh, such that, uh, which exhibits exactly the relative frequencies predicted by the GPT. So that means that we, given a set of GPTs, we can map that set backwards to a set of GPT mosaics, which are associated to those GPTs. Um, and moreover, we can then take one more, one more step and map our set of GPT mosaics to the set of possible worlds that contains those GPT mosaics. So with this terminology in hand, recall that I mentioned that uh, most results in this framework uh, take the form, take the approximate form, uh, every GPT which has feature A uh, also has feature B. Using the mapping we've just defined, we can rewrite that statement to say uh, every possible world which contains a GPT mosaic mapped by the GPT mapped to a GPT having feature A is also a possible world containing a GPT mosaic mapped by the GPT mapped to a GPT having feature B. Um, and that should start to sound fairly familiar because, of course, uh, metaphysical necessitation is frequently uh, analysed by philosophers in the possible world semantics, uh, such that A metaphysically necessitates B, uh, if and only if every possible world in which it is true that A is also a possible world in which it is true that B. Uh, so essentially what we see here is that this relation, which uh, sort of forms the backbone of, of research in the GPT framework, uh, can be understood as expressing metaphysical necessitation conditional on our being in a GPT mosaic. 
So that is to say that, that this sort of research uh, in this GPT framework can be understood as expressing the mo this modal relation of metaphysical necessitation. Uh, moreover, uh, axiomatizations of quantum mechanics are also built on this relation. They're built by uh, taking sets of GPTs and slowly narrowing down till we get only quantum mechanics. So uh, essentially an axiom of quantum axiomatization does is it provides a set of principles which together are sufficient to metaphysically necessitate quantum mechanics. That is to say, uh, axiomatizing quantum mechanics can be understood as studying modal structure and studying the modal, uh, modal facts which give rise to quantum mechanics. Now, obviously nothing I've said so far helps in particular helps particularly with the problem of selecting axioms, because of course, uh, any axiomatization of quantum mechanics whatsoever will metaphysically necessitate quantum mechanics in this sense. And the trivial, trivial axiomatization I described earlier with A and B does necessitate quantum mechanics, although just not in a in very interesting way. So to understand why we have preferences for certain sorts of axiomatizations over others, we need to make the further conjecture that uh, there exists some, some correct axiomatization of quantum mechanics, uh, which corresponds to a real objective structure def as defined uh, by reality in some sense. Uh, and I think the, the most uh, plausible way of doing that is by appeal to the concept of laws of nature. So obviously, given what I've already said about humanism, I'm not going to take a human approach and I'm not going to define laws in terms of best systems. Uh, I prefer to def define laws uh, within a, a governing paradigm of laws, uh, so a fairly robustly realist approach to lawhood. However, I am going to be a little bit anti-reductionist, and so, so I, rather than uh, providing an account of lawhood, uh, I'm simply going to describe laws uh, by, by specifying their effects. So one nice general way of specifying the effects of a law is to associate the law with a set of Humean mosaics, which is that is to say the set of Humean mosaics in which the law is is true. Um, if one wants to be even more general, one could uh, one could associate laws with probability distributions over sets of Humean mosaics, but uh, we won't need to do that in this uh, in this case. So. Uh, from the realist point of view, we describe laws uh, in terms of sets of human mosaics, and we can say that a law governs by requiring that the actual human mosaic should lie uh, within the associated sets of, set of human mosaics. Um, the, the actual laws of nature, therefore, define uh, each, each associated with a constraint, which is a set of human mosaics. Um, and we can see that uh, the, actual, the actual human mosaic must lie in the inter intersection of all of the constraints associated with the laws of nature. And I will refer, refer to those uh, special constraints defined by the laws of nature as the LON. Uh, so each law, law of nature defines a constraint um, and, and we, we know that the act actual human mosaic must lie in the intersection of all these constraints. Um, I'm also going to assume uh, for now, that the actual human mosaic lies in the set of GPT mosaics. Um, we might, for example, suppose that there's some constraint which requires that it lies in the set of GPT mosaics, or we might just suppose that just happens to be a fact. Um, either way, given that the actual human mosaic, the actual human mosaic lies in the set of GPT mosaics, and it also lies in the intersection of all of the LON, uh, we can infer that each of the LON must have some support on the set of GPT mosaics. That means that for each law of nature, we can define an associated uh, set of GPT mosaics, which consists of the support of, of that law's constraint on the set of GPT mosaics. Um, and furthermore, we can, it's clear to see that, uh, that, that um, the, these, uh, these G, that the GPT constraints associated with the laws of nature must contain in their intersection uh, the GPT uh, that holds in the actual world, which we are going to assume is quantum mechanics. So what we, we see is that the laws of nature induce a set of sets of GPT, GPT mosaics. Um, at those GPT mosaics correspond to G, sets of GPTs via the mapping we defined earlier. Um, and th that those sets of GPTs must have in their intersection quantum mechanics. So the laws of nature induce what looks very much like an axiomatization. Um, one caveat here is I haven't said anything that implies that uh, the intersection of the laws of nature must be unique. Uh, so one might perhaps uh, so one might uh, perhaps choose to add that as, a, as an additional constraint, or if one wants to adopt a really strong form of de determinism, we could suppose that the laws of nature really do single out a unique human mosaic. Um, either way, we, what we have a clear relationship between the laws of nature uh, and a set of set, set of sets of GPTs, which will single out which will single out QM uh, uniquely in the way that maximization is supposed to do. So. 
so the proposal is that uh, is that we should understand the sort of research, these sort of axiomatizations as hypotheses about what the true axiomatization uh, is as implied by the laws of nature. Um, and this approach has a number, number of nice consequences. First off, it makes it very straightforward to understand the sense in which we gain insight or understanding from these sorts of results. Uh, the insight is, is simply the normal, the usual sort of understanding that we gain when we learn the reason for something. Now, of course, given any particular axiomatization, we don't know for sure that it, it, that it is the correct axiomatization, um, but that's kind of the way that uh, explanations work in, in more normal cases as well. We, you know, if, if something happens and someone proposes an explanation for it, we normally take ourselves to have gained understanding, even if uh, they haven't given us a, a, a perfect proof that this is definitely the correct explanation. Um, second, it makes this makes it straightforward to understand uh, the reasons why we prefer certain sorts of axioms over others. Uh, those preferences are simply derived from our beliefs about the laws of nature and what the laws of nature should look like. So, for instance, if we think that the laws of nature are simple, we will also suppose that the laws of nature induce a simple set of axioms, which uh, and therefore we'll be looking for axiomatizations which have that property. Uh, and the same can be said for any any beliefs that we might have about the, the way the laws of nature should be. Uh, they will be translated in, in a straightforward way to uh, the, the axioms that we'll be looking for and that will make sense of, of the specific sorts of preferences that we have over axiomatizations. Um, and finally, I think this account also makes it, makes it uh, much easier to, to give an give to explain the scientific value of this sort of research. Um, and that's because if we take it that uh, there is some true axiomatization which is induced by the laws of nature, and if we take ourselves to be trying to find that axiomatization, uh, we can then say that if we find the correct axiomatization, we, we should be able to infer backwards uh, to the laws of nature from it. Um, and that means that uh, finding the, the correct axiomatization of quantum mechanics uh, is, is going to give us resources to, to draw on when we, when we try to do things like unify it with other theories such as gravity, or when we, when we want to apply it to new domains such as cosmology. So there's a clear argument that, that uh, finding, uh, the good, finding good axiomatizations of quantum mechanics is a scientifically useful activity. Um, and I think in, in this sense, the realist approach does much better than the sort of Humean or anti-realist approaches because uh, on, those, on those sorts of pictures, it's kind of a bit mysterious why anyone would think this was a good use of a scientist's time. Now, one concern that one might have at this point is that uh, if we are regarding every different axiomatization of quantum mechanics as representing a different possible modal structure, uh, then we seem to have a pretty serious case of underdetermination on our hands. Um, even if we think only some interesting set of axioms, axiomatizations correspond to a, a, a real possible possible structure, we still have a very have quite a large number of possible axiomatizations to contend with. Um, so one possible approach, uh, approach to take care would be the selective realist approach. So selective realism is, uh, has been proposed as a response uh, both to the problem of underdetermination and to the pessimistic meta-induction. And the idea here is that we can avoid underdetermination by being very selective about our realist commitments uh, in such a way that there's, that, uh, there's basically no possibility of underdetermination. And structural realism has sometimes been regarded as a form of determination, um, as, as a form of selective realism on the grounds that it, it sort of seems as though those structure might be less likely to be underdetermined uh, than ontology. So the selective realist approach here would be to say, uh, well, although all these axiomatizations do give us all give us information on the object of structure of reality, it's not the case that there's any one axiomatization which is correct. They're all giving us different inf information or just about different aspects of the modal structure of reality. So there's no real underdetermination going on here. However, uh, the problem with this strategy, in my view, is that it blocks the proposed uh, it blocks the proposed account of the route uh, backwards from uh, a good axiomatization to the laws of nature, because if there's no correct axiomatization, there's also no uh, no no way to infer infer back to the laws of nature from the correct axiomatization. So it becomes much more mysterious on this view um, exactly what the, the scientific purpose of this sort of activity would be. Um, and I th this is, I think, a general problem for selective realism. Uh, in general, uh, to make scientific progress, it is often necessary to consider alternative hypotheses as genuinely distinct alternatives and weigh out their pros and cons and see them as, as, as leading to different possible research programs. So a form of realism uh, which refuses to allow that there may be distinct possibilities in, or, or distinct possibilities in this way uh, 
is for a stat not a very good form of realism to adopt if you're interested in realism for the sake of doing better science. Um, and it's not even a very good form of realism if uh, you, you simply want to uh, explain what's going on in science because it leaves you unable to explain why some formulations are, are, are theoretically productive while other formulations fail to be productive. Uh, so I, I, for that reason, I'm not uh, particularly in a fan of selective realism. And I would suggest in this case, the appropriate thing to do is simply accept that we do have underdetermination here. Um, but that's not really a problem because the underdetermination points to different possible ways to different possible research programs and different possible ways to uh, move forward with the theory and to unify it with other theories. So rather than seeing the underdeterminations as a problem, um, we should simply see the underdetermination as an opportunity to make progress. So for that reason, I, I like to regard this as a form of structural but not selective realism. Now a related concern you might have is uh, is why should we, um, if, if we are going to be realist about this approach, why should we be realist about the constraints rather than simply about the GPTs? Um, after all, uh, the GPT doesn't seem to be underdetermined in the same way as structure is. It's, it is underdetermined in the sense that all probabilistic theories are underdetermined, but uh, it is much seems to be much less underdetermined than, uh, than formulations in terms of axioms and principles. And so uh, as a first response, I would make the same uh, point regarding, regarding the sort of applicability outside the theory. Uh, because GPTs are defined purely within the theory and, and uh, on a purely ad hoc basis to produce, to produce the correct probabilities as to match our observations, GPTs don't offer any route to make inferences outside the theory. Uh, so from that point of view, they're much less scientifically useful. Moreover, I also want to suggest that that GPTs, uh, that GPT realism and constraint realism, although they are empirically equivalent, they're not explanatorily equivalent. Um, and that's because uh, GPTs are defined such that we, we, we give a, a separate probability distribution for every possible combination of preparation, measurement, and transformation. Um, and there's no, there's, no, uh, there's no allowance in the GPT framework for any particular connections to, to, connections to be defined between different preparations, measurements, and transformations, because the whole purpose of the framework is to prevent us from, uh, is to avoid using any theoretical entities or theoretical frameworks which might connect different possible experiments. So what that means is that um, given uh, if, if, if your realism is, is purely in terms of GPTs, um, you, should, you shouldn't uh, expect to see any, any connections between different possible prepare, measure, transform scenarios. And in particular, um, you, should, you shouldn't expect to be able to make inferences about the results of scenarios you haven't yet tried on the basis of scenarios you have tried. Uh, so for example, uh, quantum mechanics uh, postulates an infinite set of preparations, measurements, and transformations because it allows for continuous parametrizations. And that means that clearly we can't possibly have, uh, we can't possibly have performed every possible uh, prepare, measure, transform scenario postulated by quantum mechanics because there's an infinite number of them. Uh, nonetheless, we take it that quantum mechanics gives us well-defined probabilities for all of these tests, uh, even the ones we haven't yet tried, which means that Believe that there is uh, some underlying connection between uh, different prepare, measure, transform scenarios. I and mean, then you can't really get that kind of connection from the framework of a GPT alone. You have to add some sort of, uh, some sort of constraint. At, at minimum, you'll need a consistency constraint or some sort of uh, continuity constraint in order, to, uh, in order to guarantee the connection between these different scenarios. Uh, so uh, although these two, although constraint realism and GPT realism are empirically equivalent, they're not equivalent in terms of their explanatory, explanatory power because uh, the constraint framework, unlike the GPT framework, is able to explain these connections between different tests. Uh, and that, that's insofar as you're happy to use inference the best explanation as a realist, uh, you do have good reason to be a, a constraint realist rather than a GPT realist. Okay, finally, I just want to make some comments about principle theories. Um, and that's because uh, an axiomatization of quantum mechanics looks quite a lot like a principle theory. And indeed, several people working in the field have uh, motivated their, their axiomatization by suggesting that they're trying to write a principle theory formulation of quantum mechanics. Um, so as you probably all know, uh, the principle, term principle theory comes from Einstein, who made a distinction between uh, constructive theories and principle theories, where a constructive theory is supposed to be a detailed microscopic account of, of a process, whereas the principle theory uh, involves uh, setting out some uh, broad, empirically well-confirmed from generalizations from which we can derive interesting consequences. Um, 
so it's true that axiomatizations do look a lot like principle theories, but there does seem to be something a bit unusual going on here because uh, the motivation for uh, axiomatizing, axiomatizing quantum mechanics can't be the same as the motivation that Einstein originally produced for principle theories. So Einstein was, was largely of the view that constructive theories are superior to principle theories and that we should uh, use principle theories only in cases where we haven't yet been able to come up with the underlying constructive theory. Um, and that doesn't seem to be what's going on here because we already have a constructive theory of the phenomena in question, which is to say standard quantum mechanics. So it's a bit mysterious why, if, 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 you, if you accept Einstein's account, any, why anyone would want to, want to start writing down principle theories when we already have a constructive theory. Um, so uh, Grinbaum suggests that, that we, have, we, we should see this as a um, move in the philosophy. Uh, constructive theories as primary towards seeing principle theories as uh, genuine final theories in their own right. Um, and if that's the case, we do need a different account of what the role is of principle theories and how they relate to constructive theories. Um, and I think the structural realism uh, is a really nice way of doing that because we can see the original constructive theory as being uh, a form of standard object-oriented realism, which is, the, which is formulated in terms of theoretical entities. And we can see the uh, axiom, axiom principle theory version as being the, the structural realist equivalent, which makes the same predictions, but does away with reference to any of these the theoretical entities. So that explains why we might find it interesting to, to write down principle theories, uh, even in cases we do already have a constructive theory. So finally, I just want to talk a little bit about the future of GPTs. Um, so if, if you buy that uh, GPTs in the, in the quantum case are a way of studying modal structure and are a particular form of structural realism, you might wonder if we can do similar things in other, other areas of physics. Um, and some, some steps have been made in this direction. There exists some interesting operational formulations of GIA um, and also a method version of quantum field theory due to Hardy. Um, Hardy also has also has some suggestions to make about quantum gravity. And uh, I think the hope is that um, operational formulations might lead to progress because we can we can formulate quantum theory and GR uh, in a broadly operational way, which might perhaps make it easier to to bring them together. Um, in a somewhat different direction, obviously the principle theory, obviously the um, GPT framework, although it is quite general, does nonetheless build in some uh, theoretical assumptions. So in particular, it assumes, because it, because it works in terms of uh, preparations, measurements, and transformations, which are naturally supposed to have a temporal order, uh, this framework does presuppose some notion of, of temporal order and of, of a causal order. Um, and given that, uh, if, if one wants to, to, to apply this, this framework to uh, areas of physics where there, is, where there isn't a well-defined causal or temporal order, such as quantum gravity, um, it seems one would probably want to generalize this framework so it doesn't depend on a temporal order in its way anymore. Um, so that, uh, that has, has been partially done in what's known as the process framework due to Ereshkov and Cerf, uh, where we model, um, which generalizes the operational framework to allow us to make allow us to do to find results which don't depend on a predefined causal order and there's been some really nice results in that framework already for instance um, it's been shown by shrapnel and costa that uh, even without a standard uh, temporal order quantum mechanics will still exhibit contextuality so, uh, so so there's definitely some interesting things going on in that domain um right so uh, yeah so that's basically all i have to say i've argued argued that uh, generalized probabilistic theories don't have to be interpreted as a, in a sort of instrumentalist framework. They can be understood in a very realist way as an approach to studying modal structure, and thus they can be understood as a novel uh, new application of structural realism, um, uh, which, which opens the door for, for structural realism to be applied in this novel way to various other areas of physics as well. Yeah, so that, that's all for me. Any questions? <laughs>